thank you for that setup. <laughs> um, I want immediately to uh, disagree with the title that we chose. Um, in fact, on a different version on the train this morning, I have to change the title because I've been reminded over and over in this conference that it is so easy to slide between an adjective um, attributing a quality to an object rather than make, recognizing that it's actually a relationship between the valuer and the object that is being described. So it isn't really qualities of proof. Uh, what the best I could come up with was qualities attributed to proof, but they're qualities uh, which we can then attribute to the sensitivities of the individual. That will make sense in a minute. So, uh, hello? Okay. Outline, brief outline. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background motivation for what Gila and I have been started working on together. Um, I want to say a couple of remarks about methods of inquiry because I warn you my methods of inquiry are unusual. Um, then try to uh, draw your attention to the phenomena of interest to us and end with some conjectures concerning pedagogical implications. Uh, hopefully we get that far. Um, the background was a paper by Tim Gowers in 2007 uh, in which he asks what makes a proof memorable. And um, he was, he's seeking objective criteria. So he's in the camp of it's the quality of the proof that makes it memorable. And he's, he, psychologists have told him that this might not be uh, as easy as it sounds. He's looking for ways to make it as objective as possible. Um, he introduces the notion of the width of a proof based on computer science calculations. What's the number of ideas you need simultaneously, the, the maximum number of ideas you need simultaneously in order to carry out that proof? Now, there's a lot of questions about whether you store things, you know, you know, how much you actually need, but he has a sense of the width which he elaborates. Um, I encountered these ideas uh, when uh, attending CERMI uh, earlier this year in the paper by Gila, and we started talking about it and developing ideas from it. Um, and she raises questions, um, a, a good number of questions, summarized here as the notion of width doesn't really do justice to other qualities, such as, and the whole list we've had, all 80 of them, plus perhaps even, uh, I'm not sure, is any all 80 have been mentioned already? Um, but um, my interest, as you will hear, is in the lived experience. And so I want to probe beneath the surface. The words that we've been talking about are, to me, surface words. All they are is indicators of something. I want to know what is really being indicated. And one of my favorite quotes, my favorite author, it is only after you have come to know the surface of things that you venture to see what is underneath. But the surface is inexhaustible. <laughs> Italo Calvino. Now I think most mathematicians would actually disagree. Perhaps all of us would disagree because we have become enculturated into probing beneath the surface rel relatively quickly. But um, as a novel, if this is in a novel, um, so I do like that. Anyway, um, that's justifying why I want to go beneath the surface. So Gila and I wrote a paper which we submitted uh, to FLM, in which we um, mentioned depth, um, which might consist of things like number of key ideas. Uh, here I'm using the notion of key ideas in a, in a natural language sense, not in the technical sense that Manu uses it. I mean, by here, key ideas, key steps, uh, significant points in the global proof, um, built from conceptual insights that might be necessary and um, what we're still calling technical handles, but again we use it differently from the way Manu uses it, and I'll, if, if there's time and uh, appropriateness, I'll come back to what those mean. But we also picked up from, from Hirsch, who was following Goffman, the notion of front and back. In the theater, we often talk about front of, front of house and uh, backstage. In a restaurant, you go in to have a nice meal, but you have the faintest idea what chaos is going on uh, at the back. So there's a real difference between those two. And um, uh, all I think Hirsch is doing is drawing attention to what I would call a fact from experience that um, what builds up to a mathematical proof 
is not the same as what gets presented and printed in journals and presented in seminars. There's an inner and an outer, and that's been alluded to in some of the talks we've had already. Um, but uh, I couldn't resist the connection front. I, I grew up in North America. Uh, front, back, and sides, you recognize that it's just a phrase. That, it's a kind of haircut. But once you hear front, once I hear front and back, I get sides. And I think it's actually quite a useful notion, uh, developing a side view or a personal narrative for how the proof works. So these are some ideas that we think might be more helpful than uh, just saying what is the width of a proof in order to ask whether it's memorable. So that's the background. And now, um, because people like to be on email and things, let me tell you our conclusions, and then you can go back to your emails. <laughs> our conclusion is that the core to memorability is actually reconstructability. Can I reconstruct the proof? Now, of course, under what conditions? If you just got it off an airplane from a 24-hour flight and you the jet lag, your reconstruction um, uh, uh, qualities may be a little bit different than if you've had a really good night's sleep and you've been talking to people about these ideas anyway in the last month. Uh, it's going to be quite different. But even so, or, or perhaps because of that, it's still mostly subjective and idiosyncratic rather than objective. I can reconstruct some things, other things I can't. Uh, in any given situation, and it seems to me to act, and, and I dare say to us, that this is really situated. Um, I've added this, but Gila hasn't seen this next point, so I hope she agrees with it. Um, reconstructability really depends on personal connections and associations and links. I'm going to give you an, offer, an opportunity to think about this in a minute. Um, um, it, there are, for me, four things. What comes to mind in a fresh situation? <coughs> What comes to action before cognition kicks in? <coughs> Have you ever seen students you give them a task and they immediately start doing something? Has that ever happened? Well, one, one person recognizes this. Of course, none of you would ever do that. You would sit back and think very deeply first. But um, um, there are lots of things where the action comes first and the cognition is way behind. And what comes to heart, uh, which is a expression at this point in the last few days, in the way of dispositions and commitment, because that also determine or influences what might be constructible. And then, as a result of those, what comes to attention. I could uh, go on and spend uh, two or three hours just talking about some of these ideas, but that's not my purpose, and so I will move on. Method of inquiry. My method of inquiry is particularly idiosyncratic. Um, I'm interested in lived experience, so they call that phenomenological. Uh, but I have my own version. Um, the, the consequence of that is that you're meant to engage. Uh, you all have a filing card. I gave you, a, put a filing card within epsilon of your chair. Um, and so I appreciate it if you get the filing card out, please. Because I'm going to ask, oh yes, I should make a couple remarks. Um, why do I do this? Because the, the data that I would like to offer you is what happens inside you when I offer you a task or a program. That's my data. In fact, it's your data. Because I won't have it. So the data is immediate lived experience. The product of the way I work is not p-values, as Matthew well knows, <laughs> and it is not factual information. It's um, a sensitivity to notice something happening in the future that might inform your future practice. So the, the, the product of research is some developed sensitivity for you and uh, particularly probes and tasks and exercises which might provoke people to become sensitized to something that previously they might not have been. Okay, so that, that's my line. Um, so, would you please consider what one or two theorems stand out for you as being memorable or marvelous in some way? I've deliberately used the word marvelous, it's not been on the list. And so I wanted to bring in a new term. Could you think of one or two theorems that stand out, perhaps from as an undergraduate, when you were doing, or when you were doing mathematics? What stands out for you as being memorable? Could you just make a note of it on the card, please? One or two.
submit that what is interesting is not what you wrote down, but what you noticed about how you inspected your experience. That's what's interesting. And in another situation, I wouldn't want to get people to talk about that and make a really interesting discussion around that. But that's the data I'm actually offering you, is what did you do? And I have a couple of questions, but I have one more probe here. What do you remember about their proofs? Could you, for example, walk out, uh, stand up here and give an immediate proof of one of the ones that you wrote down? Could you reconstruct a proof on the fly? Or what's it like to say, I, I, I sort of, yeah, what's your relationship with the proof? That's what I'm asking. Proof or proofs. So, interesting question, interesting to me question, how did you go about doing that? Did you imagine yourself at a board with, a, with an audience behind you? Did you imagine yourself in, a, in your study with a piece of paper and you might be about to write down the proof? Or did you just sit there and not do anything at all? <laughs> all are, certainly those are possible responses. What I'm interested in is the psychology or the, the, the lived experience of trying to bring something to mind and trying to pay attention to what, what is it about the thing you're trying to bring to mind which gives you access to the thing you're trying to bring to mind. <clears throat> A couple of things I wrote down on the train just to... Uh, oh, sorry, could you present a proof? Sorry, I forgot that. Could you present the main proof ideas? Sorry, I forgot those. Could you present the main proof ideas? What sort of responses? How many people feel like they could present the main proof ideas to one of the proofs they wrote down? Most we get, people? We get time to prepare. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> you get time to prepare. Right. <laughs> I mean, obviously, yeah. It's that. that's, but that's, that's, it's that sort of sense of, it's there, it's almost accessible, but I haven't quite got it. I need time to just remember it, just go through it, just rehearse it, reconstruct it. It's that, that's the sort of lived experience that I'm after. Um, because, and because my main aim is to develop some uh, tasks and exercises for teachers so that they can develop relevant tasks and exercises for students which will help them reconstruct proofs in a way that's more efficient than they, they do so far. Um, good, okay. Uh, and these are trivial questions, but did you write down the first theorem that came to mind? Or did you say, no, I don't, I, let, let's see if I can get a better one. <laughs> a different one. Well, what was your criteria? Now, I would like to have a discussion about this, but well, I, I've got other things I want to say. Please. Yeah, I mean, I was tempted to write down something, one of the last ten things I've thought about, but then I tried to just relax my brain and see what actually came up as bigger. That was more memorable. More memorable. Right. But memorability is not an obvious construct, it seems to me. Uh, it depends on all, all sorts of factors which are involved. Okay, so let me tell you, uh, oh wait, sorry. Did you select from the first few what criteria might you have used, or perhaps you did something else? Okay. Um, uh, in, in the paper that uh, Gila presented in Surmi, and we've used it again in the draft of the paper that we've submitted, um, we uh, used an example from Tim Gowers because it seems to me and to us, I think, to really um, draw attention to one factor about reconstruction. So the phenomenon is you're asked to reconstruct a proof that root 2 is irrational and present it. Can you get yourself into a state where in the next five minutes you're actually going to have to come up here and do it? Please. Obviously, there isn't time. Maybe you could, but it would be very pleasant. It wasn't a very pleasant experience. Whoops. Well, that's uh, that's for you to judge. <laughs> okay. Um, now, you immediately have.
have come to mind a proof by contradiction which you could present to students without really having to think about it. That's my conjecture. How am I, how am I doing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you've been teaching mathematics at all relatively recently, basically you could just do it. Okay. So what about the following proof from Tim Gowers? This is a proof that I not seen, but had not seen before. Root 2 is irrational. Assume that root 2 is a rational number. Ah, that's I knew they were going to start like that. How else could we start? <laughs> This would mean that there are positive integers p and q with q not zero such that p over q equals root 2. We may assume that the fraction p over q is in its lowest term, so p and q are oh, positive integers which are so as small as possible as a presentation of root 2. That's how everybody would begin. Perhaps not quite as articulately, but um, <laughs> certainly I wouldn't have been in my first go. But um, anyway, okay. Uh, so now root 2 can be written as p over q equals root 2 which equals root 2 multiplied by root 2 minus 1 over root 2 minus 1, which is 2 minus root 2 over root 2 minus 1. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> then, substituting p over q for root 2 in this final expression, but using this bit, we have p over q is 2 minus p over q divided by p over q minus 1. And if you buy my algebra, I wouldn't recommend it in general, but I have checked it four or five times. It's t, that comes out to 2q minus p over p minus q. Am I any the wiser? <laughs> I feel, I feel as so I'm being led down some, some forest path that isn't well marked, if, if even visible at all. Okay, but because p over q is root 2, it lies between 1 and 2. Quick check, 1.414, yep. Uh, so we have q less than p less than 2q. And a little bit of um, jiggery pokery, and you discover that 2q minus p is less than p, and p minus q is less than q. I've omitted the mucking around with inequalities, but I guarantee those, those are correct. So this is smaller than p, and this is smaller than q. Now we're back to the original, the, the ordinary proof. This produces a fraction equal to p over q, but smaller in the numerator and denominator, contradicting the initial assumption that p and q are as small as possible. So the assumption that p over q is in lowest terms, i.e. that root 2 is rational, must be false. Is anybody surprised by this proof? Oh, come on. You would all reconstruct it, would you? Well, you could all construct it that straight up. But you're not surprised. Oh, oh, good. Here, come on. You've got to admit, you know, you've got to, it doesn't hurt to admit things. <laughs> no, I was a bit surprised. It's between not being surprised and being able to reconstruct it, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's probably yeah. the yeah. descent yeah. method, so, and, and this sort of feels like a descent. Okay. Well, well, you did kind of prime us for being surprised. You said, you know. Oh, yeah, you're you right. You said, this is a trick invented by Tim Gowers. Yes. Touch it. Touch it. But is that, it seems to me that's the step. Where did that come from? Yeah, Out of the blue. Mind. Out of the blue. Now, it seems to me that if you were going, if you were required, uh, let's say, in three weeks' time, to reconstruct Tim Gowers' proof without committing to memory root two minus one divided by root two minus one, how would you go about it? You need to know where this came from. Why was this a good choice? Am I making sense here? Okay. So this, to me, is an example of, in this proof, is a key idea, a key step. This thing that comes in from out of the blue. Now, one could, might want to reason, or at least um, describe, in, um, when students are in school or when undergraduates are at university, a lot of the steps in the proofs have this quality. They suddenly, suddenly this extra step comes from outside. Wasn't even thinking of that, and bang! Oh, look, it all works. Why? What's going on? Okay, uh, can you, could you quickly imagine yourself reconstructing this style of proof, but for root 3? Yeah, it's probably the same. It's probably the same. So what is this going to be? Well, I, well there's a few minus one over root 3. One. Root, root 3 minus 1 over root 3 minus 1 because root 3 lies between 1 and 2. Yes. I have not been able to make that work. Oh. I have not been able to make that work. There's somewhere else it's coming from. 
I don't believe you can go measure work. Well, I couldn't. <laughs> 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 what well, that tells you is about all I'm doing is describing yeah, my, my, my inabilities. <laughs> no, in fact, this comes from the origin of that is in the continued fraction expansion of root 2. Yeah, we can see that there, but, but why is root? Uh, so root For root 3, you need to use an expression where, where, where something normalizes. The, the term you use actually has to, has to normalize to 1. And um, so, it, but without that insight, the proof is actually irrelevant to you. You might remember the proof in the form of, uh, you have to multiply by something clever, which is the form of something over itself. But you can't remember exactly what the thing is that is on, is on the numerator and right. denominator. You need the technical facility to work out what the correct thing is. If I asked you for root 17, uh, you might spend a lot of time looking, unless you know where it's coming from. So we're using that, we, we use this example to indicate the difference between having, um, uh, uh, knowing about a step that's needed or having an insight into a direction of travel and having sufficient technical facility to actually carry it through. Um, so, I've got some commentary here, it's probably what I've just been saying, but anyway. To appreciate and remember, indeed to reconstruct this reasoning, you need to know where this came from. And how did he know to do that? And um, I'll say at the end, but I'll say it now as well. There's a lot of research on worked examples in mathematics. What is it about a worked example that actually helps you? <coughs> a huge amount. And my summary of it is, the key thing is not to know what the step is, but how did the person know to make that step? Which is precisely what I think is going on here. How did the person know to multiply by something, uh, by one, but in a particular form, and how did they know that particular form? Well, uh, Gower says, if one comes upon a step that seems arbitrary, and if one then comes to see why it is not arbitrary after all, then one is more likely to be able to think of similar steps for oneself in the future. Seems plausible. Um, and the notion of arbitrary and necessary is a, quite a useful construct in my, from my point of view uh, in mathematics education that I need to tell students things that are arbitrary, but if things are necessary, then we ought to find ways so that we together can work out what is necessary. Uh, so it's the issue of what is arbitrary and what is necessary. Unfortunately, many, many students in schools in this country, and in my experience in lots of other countries, see mathematics as largely arbitrary. Largely arbitrary. Okay, and Gowers also says, now, when mathematicians talk of proofs containing ideas, interesting container metaphor there, uh, what they are referring to is demonstrations of how to generate a step that would otherwise not have sprung to mind. And so this is where I, the notion of a key, a key idea or a key, key step uh, um, comes into play. And then I wrote down, oh, uh, an example of uh, Viviani's theorem, which is one that um, um, Gila used in her paper, and Shiva's theorem uh, are examples where you need to remember, it has to come to mind, or to action, uh, at least, to use areas if you're going to get a reasonable, reconstruct a reasonable proof. Um, and uh, that's the stuff about uh, worked examples, Rankle and his many colleagues. Um, and in the background here, it seems to me, is the role of a personal narrative, having some story that comes to mind, it's triggered by the, the statement of the theorem, by connections that you that you have already been established in, your, in the complex network that constitutes your understanding, and that generates a narrative, and the narrative it may be what helps you drive the reconstruction. Um, so in order to um, pursue some of these in terms, these ideas in terms of finding out whether we can be helpful to teachers and hence to students. Um, we started collecting some observations and I'm hoping that you will be willing to uh, leave the, your cards behind so that I can peruse your observation, observations that you have made. Um, obvious source is proofs from the book, um, which we, have, we know about but haven't uh, started going through in detail. There are two examples that I put into the draft paper in FLM and um, if it seems appropriate, 
we'll make a modification of that paper and submit it to, uh, to this meeting. Um, uh, several people, I've just used their initials, uh, cited Morley's theorem, but said I can't recall the proof. I know it's complicated, but I can't recall it. Yes? You agree? <laughs> I agree too. I can't remember how the proof goes. Um, he cites discrete dynamical systems in one dimension. Period 3 implies chaos in its most general form. And he knows the key ingredients of the intermediate value theorem and chasing intervals. But you would have to really work in order to reconstruct it. It's not all necessarily a nice proof or a neat proof. Or a, a readily um, carried out proof. Um, JM, but not me, uh, cites Cantor's um, uh, interval 0, 1 is non-denumerable, and recall, he has a sense of recalling the essence of the proof. Cites Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, recalls the key steps in the proof, and appreciates it because of deep philosophical implications. Now what I'm inviting you to do here is to re see if there's resonance in the kinds of things that people are saying here with what you experienced when I asked you to think about the theorem and the proof. Um, A.W. cited Cauchy's integral of a complex function around a pole, but can't recall the proof, is really, is it not only the aware of that, but it's aware that it'd be a really hard job <laughs> to recall. Um, um, W.W. cites his own work on extending theorems to higher dimensions using cones to lift an object to a higher dimension. The power and utility of the method in many different situations. And C.F. Uh, cites Euclid's infinitely many primes. And Pythagoras remarks on proofs with a simple but non-intuitive statement and what he called an elegant proof. CF is a, is a teacher, teacher educator, the others are, most of the others are mathematicians. One of the things that happened when we were just carrying out this little experiment um, uh, with a dozen or so people that um, we thought would reply to our emails is the propensity to, to uh, move to things that are from your own work. Did anybody, did anybody experience that? As a, as a mathematician? I, mean, I certainly did. When I was thinking of these ideas, really the, the, the really complicated proofs tended to be, you know, which, which were the ones I was interested in, not, not simple ones, were tended to be ones that I was really familiar with and ones that I had worked on myself um, came, to, you know, came public to the surface. So, some general remarks. When others cite a once familiar theorem, there's a slight upwelling of enthusiasm and creation and a, why didn't I think of that theorem? Oh, I didn't conduct that here, if we, if we didn't have enough time, but you, somebody announces, oh, I think this theorem is really marvelous. You think, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that one, but it is. So there's a sort of a community um, uh, re recovering, because it's hard to dig into your memory. The memorability might, seems to involve a personal effort or activity in order to probe beneath the surface of reasoning provided, so making an effect, an affective link as well as cognitive and behavioral. And that's why, uh, I think, why we're not at all convinced that memorability could be, um, could be objective. Um, so, um, what mathematicians seem to do, uh, based on um, our reading and our experience, distinguish between understanding each step of a proof and understanding the whole proof. Mathematicians recognize families of proofs which contain common structure and seek proof techniques. Um, it's just popped into my head that there's a very good question floating around, what has all this got to do with values? Um, and it seems to me that uh, what I'd like to put forward is that the way mathematicians express their um, their attempts to reconstruct a proof, for example, or what, what are obstacles to reconstructing a proof, is actually an expression of the sorts of things they value about the practice of being, uh, the profession of being a mathematician. And, and I'm trying to get it down, down to a level of detail where um, we can help teachers manifest the values that they espouse 
and um, make those accessible at least to students. Uh, mathematicians seem to distinguish between interesting and standard steps of a proof. Um, Gowers uh, uses a, a, the proof of the, the infinity of primes as something that he can just sit down and do without thinking at all. Whereas the root two one, he's got this little special step that he brings in, um, and so there's, which has perhaps an interesting step in it. So there's a difference between what you can do because of your, your competence, your, sophistic, your mathematical sophistication, and what you need to import or to have access to in order to carry out the proof of something that's more complicated. Um, mathematicians describe proofs to each other at completely different levels of detail.